I have two special guests. Now, we have a familiar guest today, but I'm going to start by introducing some guests I don't think we've had the privilege of having with us today. Uh, so we have Vic Teresic and Marianne Croce, and I want, and I think I pronounced that right for both of you. <laughs> okay. Vic, <laughs> <you> correct me. <laughs> it's Sorry. Teresic. Teresic. Thank you. All right. Oh. See, now, now, see, as far as compelling speech goes, I think one of the most important things to remember is there is no sound better than hearing one's own name <laughs> spoken properly. So I'm glad we started with this. So important <laughs> with our clients, too. Uh, Vic, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Let us know a little about you, and then we'll do the same for you in a moment, Marianne. Thank you, Craig. My name is Vic Tarasik. I'm with Shop Owner Coach. I'm a veteran of the automotive repair industry. I've had a shop for 30 years been coaching for the last seven, learned a lot along the way, learned one of the most important things was, was learning how to speak, but also how to listen. Absolutely. Former technician, I understand, yes, correct? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, still got my master's. That's great. No, nope. <laughs> we share that in common. Now, Marianne, I know you as a still current transmission shop owner. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm Marianne Croce, and I am a current owner of a transmission shop in Connecticut. My husband and I opened it in 1999, and I am also a business performance coach as well. And I have learned over the years through Toastmasters that business grows as owners and leaders grow, and Toastmasters is just a great way to do that. Brilliant. Thanks, Marianne. And Chris, we need to have you introduce yourself again, too. Oh, okay. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I am Chris Cloutier, the owner and founder of AutoFlow, as well as owner and founder of two auto repair shops in Rowlett and Wiley in Texas, Golden Rule Auto Care. And Craig, thank you for finally inviting me to one of these panels. I'm excited. Yeah. I feel like it's been a year since I've been here. I don't know how I got banned from your your uh your different webinars but thank you I, i'm gonna try and do better this time than i have in the past craig it, it's not you it's me no i'm so glad it's the improved background michael likes That's my it. background this is by the way art from one of my service advisors wife made this art for me mm -hmm. so this is a this is a a rare thing for me to actually have a nice background Hey, but it is usually garage. We are in the garage business. I mean, hey, that's all right, too. It is. Now, this is about communication today, folks. And I appreciate everyone on this panel. Uh, with the industry background that we have, uh, Marianne, with the transmission business, that's my background, too. Vic is a technician as well. And Chris now encompasses a great deal of the shop management and, and uh, software experience that I share. So multiple shared experience. But the most important one, I think, with this panel today is everyone here is now multiple years over veterans of Toastmasters International. Uh, that's something that we're going to talk about a couple of times to hear as this is about communication training. Uh, so real quick, actually, Vic, how, how long have you been a member of Toastmasters? 2005. So that would put me at 18 years. Nice. Marianne? I started, I think, about seven, eight years ago. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And Chris? I want to say around, yeah, 2000, 2001, 2002, it's, it's been quite some time, Craig. Mm -hmm. So I'm the baby years. in this group on that point, because that's almost four years. It'll be four years at the end of June for me. Uh, that's cool. Now, let's take a look at the poll results from our registrations here. I like to ask this. This is not the first time we've asked this, and this is, of course, 100% scientific results, uh, totally run with these numbers. This is accurate for the whole industry. How many hours of communication training does your service staff receive? Now, this is actually a good cross sample of our clients, I will say. And I think that the obvious thing here is the right side of this circle. Uh, none as far as 9.5%, which thankfully it's a low number and I'm not here to, to condemn anyone on that point. Uh, I, I appreciate everyone's poll response there. I, and I think by the end of this, we'll have this hopefully corrected with you folks a little bit. A few hours a year, it's not a lot, right? A few hours is not a lot of training, but that's sometimes for our service staff. I don't know why. I think service staffs anyways, tell me if you guys agree with this. I don't feel like service staff goes to as many training events as technicians do. Yeah, no, they, I, I totally agree with you. They don't, they're, they're extremely busy. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's one thing. Uh, 
in many cases, they're, they may not be as motivated or the, the owner is not as motivated to put them into communication training or in any type of training for that matter. Mm-hmm. There's a whole, a whole slew of training out there for them where they yes. can get a whole heck of a lot better than they are. Yeah. Absolutely. And owner might not realize the resources that are available. Mm-hmm. And uh, my, and my, go ahead. My, my coach used my coach used to say, "It's only money." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the be, better you get, the more you sell of it, and you know, they stay the same. You always get the same. Chris, Craig, I would I would say too that I would wonder if, and a lot of these shop owners don't realize that, you know, we see training training sometimes as a, as a, as a formal class or something they go to, I wonder if rephrased, if we say, how many times do we spend uh, using and going over different types of scenarios, sales type scenarios, and we, we script out certain things. How many times do you review phone calls with your service advisors? To me, that ongoing training is actually happening a lot of the times. And maybe we don't count that as training, but mm-hmm. to me, that certainly is training. If you're going back and you're critiquing, and we're going to talk about Toastmasters later, if I'm going, I'm listening to the phone calls of my service advisor, and I'm going and giving them good feedback, and I'm giving them the negative feedback or things to improve on, I would absolutely say, that's training. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, you're right. Even if it's a five, five minute, you know, know, a real world example, let me, let me give you an example of what, what you've done, and how you've been doing, and how you might rephrase that, and what example you might step into yeah so now my perfectly scientific study has just had some holes shot in it by chris because (laughs) now he's saying that some of those that said none probably have been doing something all along this is why i don't get invited back craig this is why i don't get invited back (laughs) (laughs) i think that was a fantastic point to make on there because i do think you're right that that we aren't qualifying ourselves as uh and our feedback as as qualitative of training uh and that's probably not true but then again toastmasters That's one of those things we'll talk about later is the ability to give feedback. Shop owners who do feel better about giving feedback can start to recognize what they're offering as training. And that's, that's powerful. Uh, One other comment from, from uh, Lee in chat there is BG products is typically the only training that we end up with on a regular basis. I thought that's interesting too, because very product, very uh, service specific uh, items, not necessarily a broader communication training piece, but they're very focused on product. And I do feel that most of the training that is offered, that typically becomes the case. Uh, fascinating results. And hey, it isn't all bad anyways, weekly, monthly, quarterly training, a good cross section here too. I'm encouraged uh, to see that communication training is at least uh, something we're paying attention to a little bit more. And I think that it's uh, it's worth defining what our objectives are a little bit. We mentioned confidence at the counter, power of compelling speech. What is this? To each of you, I think there are some good definitions, but I think that can vary from person to person. What are you looking for with service advisors? Marianne, I stepped in last time. You, I, I'm going to toss the ball to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think for service advisors, uh, they focus on their role, which is which they want to do and they need to do mm-hmm. to complete, achieve their goals, right? Achieve their obje- objectives. But I think to concentrate on the customer and to look at the customer coming in, look at everything from their point of view, their vantage, if you will, because they could have had a bad experience in the past. Don't think, take things personally, look at it always from their point of view. I think that helps remove that personal side. So you won't get easily offended or jarred and you can stay professional. Mm Mm-hmm. And when, yeah. when I see this is when, a, you know, I'm going to big piggyback on what Marianne said, when a, when a customer shows up at the shop, if the advisor has a technician background, like I did, what are they looking to do? We're looking to fix the car. Is the customer describing the, the issues, the solutions? We're, we're running through our head what scenarios it could be. And we may share some of that with the customer. We may not. But one of the things we're not doing is we're not staying engaged. We're not listening to every one of their concerns because one might pique our interest. And, you know, nothing can be more challenging to a customer than when they've shared with you a number of items they want you to look at and you've missed their primary concern and focused on three others. Yeah, or you have to ask, ask them to restate. You really, if anything, we should be asking them the questions back and, and saying, we've heard X, Y, and Z. Is that accurate? 
and and that's the, to me that's like when advisor's key role is to be a really good listener. Yeah, absolutely. But no, technicians know better. <laughs> well, There's a logical and, progression into so, a service advisor role. To so pull on Vic's point, right? We we typically listen to, to for 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 our turn to to talk, right? That's what mm -hmm. we're listening for. We're listening for the pause in the conversation, and and we're not actually you know clarifying. And I I, I agree hundred percent, right? Like. Are they trained to listen well, to clarify, to understand? And then that confidence, right, when they're talking. I, here's one thing that we talk about at our shops that I think service advisors get into a, a problem with sometimes is they think confidence means that they have to have the answer. No, you can say confidently, I'll get you that answer. I have some very trained people in the back here that are all ASC certified, and I will get you that answer, and I'll get back to you, and, and I'll be confident with the answer that I have, right, versus I've seen it before, and we've got to sometimes get our guys out of this, that you're not there at the counter, like you said, to your, your, your job is to get them in and let the professionals look over that vehicle, right, listen to their concerns, clarify their concerns, and then give them the feeling and that and that confidence in, in their in their consumerism to say, hey, we, we can solve this, right? Yeah. I've got the people to solve it. And they, they're not solving it necessarily on the phone yeah. as some of them try to do. Spot well, on. And well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, well, I was Chris... gonna say, Marianne, you would appreciate this because my my experience at 18, 19 year old Craig trying to sell transmission work there, that was immediately what I tried to do was tried to yes. prove people with my technical prowess of the terms I could throw out. And that was the, where I would gain my credibility and therefore sales. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And everything that you're all saying reminds me of that quote. I hope I don't botch it, but people don't care how much, you know, until mm -hmm. they know how much you care. Yeah. And it's so yeah. true, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a perfect segue, I think, into the JD Power results that just dropped May 2, folks. Uh, this is hot off the press here this month. Uh, congratulations, congratulations to Christian Brothers four times in a row winning this index uh, in terms of best satisfaction. But interestingly, satisfaction overall in the entire segment was slightly lower than it was the previous year, specifically in a category for the service advisor's satisfaction. I highlighted it in red here. I don't like reading from slides, but I think it's worth putting this out in, in spoken word. Customer satisfaction is lower for the performance of the service advisor, specifically noting increased wait times, fewer advisors providing helpful advice, and there is lower satisfaction with service advisor courtesy. Mm. Interesting, right? Yeah. What do you think on this? So, the, you know, the, it's funny that last sentence is what grabs me. There's lower satisfaction with service advisor courtesy. You know, please thank you that are genuine. Conveys a lot. How, how about when we make a mistake in the shop? Because we do. Yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. A, a well-placed, I'm sorry, a well-placed thank you. You know, that that garners a lot of confidence, trust. It bonds you to the customer. It creates what we like to call, it, it, or, you know, chopper and coach sticky points. It's kind of like that tree frog. You know, you adding sticky points, they're more, they're less apt to go away because they're one more sticky point to you. Yeah, it's a good visual. Yeah, Craig, I'll I'll, I'll jump in here. One, uh, Gerald, thank you for pointing out that I don't have enough hair on this panel. I get it now. That is what I've been missening. <laughs> Lee, I, I, I saw your question. I apologize. I don't mean say I don't know. Like if you know, you know, right? The whole point was it's okay to be confident in saying, hey, I can get you an answer on that. That's yeah. that was my point to that. So I don't I don't want to discount. I have very educated service advisors um, on my counter that can speak very intelligently about cars and problems like that. But the problem we get into is when they don't and they start kind of jibber jamming about something that they don't understand. And it's like, yeah. you're, you're sitting there in the back, you know, and you're cringing like, ah, just go get the answer. We've heard um, these moments. Yes. Craig, I, I, yeah. Craig, I would say this, this is an interesting thing. I, I And I want to make this point, right? So busy, busy, everybody's busy. And we hear this busy is a four letter word, you know, uh, it, it's become our society. We're, we're constantly connected to the machines. We're constantly connected to technology. We're constantly getting emails, updates, dings, this, that, bing, 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 right? So it's creating a stressed environment for all of us. Bingo. And I, I would just like to point out that, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go biblical here. Um, love takes time, right? And Jesus pointed this out multiple times in the Bible, Love takes time and, and love and connection takes time. 
And that's something that we've we've gotten away from because of our busy lives have just started to dominate what it is. I mean, look at Lazarus, you know, in the Bible, it was his best friend, Jesus' best friend. He finds out he's going to, you know, he's, he's sick and he doesn't go running over to that village to go to go save his friend. He waits two days. Mm-hmm. Right. He waits. To, he doesn't just like, oh, I got to go. Like he was Jesus was never busy. If you read anything about Jesus, he was like, I'm taking my time. But everything always worked out for the better. But I think love is connection. And I think we need to realize that if we really want to connect with somebody, it's okay to spend those couple minutes with them. Because I think, Marianne, you said this earlier, like we're so task driven. People at the counter are task driven to get that job. Or maybe you, Vic, one of y'all said that, you know, service advisors are very task driven. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I got to get this done. I got to get this done. But then we lose out on the connection. And when we're selling value, the value comes in that connection. And that sometimes takes a couple more minutes of time to explain to this customer what's going on. So we got to be careful about our busy lives and, and us taking away from the love or caring that we do have for our customers. And I think that's part of it, right, Craig, is Absolutely. our service advisors are busy. Yeah, there, there, there's, no, there's no loyalty to transactions. Mm-mm. There's loyalty to relationships. Bingo. And being busy and taking time. And you're right, Jesus was not, he was in no rush to get anywhere. <laughs> and everyone knew his love. Yes. And I think, it, I think it's huge that we do the same thing behind the counter, connect with the customer. And there's a balance there because some advisors, they can be more chatty than others. And some can be more succinct. And it's finding that balance because, you know, customers can be very gracious, especially if you have a chatty advisor. And, and they might cause them not want to come back because they value their time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, but you know, I love the phrase "show the love." Just show show them that you love them, and give them your time. Absolutely, Mary. There's nothing more, nothing more precious than your time. Absolutely, um, Mary. And I'm not hearing your audio. Uh oh. Uh oh. We'll get you back. Hmm. No. No audio. You're unmuted, though. I'm sorry to see that. We'll uh, we'll let you correct that because I, w- I want to get your, your feedback on this. Oh, Can you hear me now? There, no, there it is. Okay. I don't know what happened. So I wanted to touch on the um, part of this where it says that they noticed that there were fewer advisors providing helpful advice ah. and there was an increase in wait times. And I think to both of your points, uh, Vic and, and Chris, what you were saying that what shops are doing in a lot of cases is their team feels because they are, they do have a lot of work coming into the shop. Mm-hmm. They're having to do more with less people because they may even be shorthanded. Mm-hmm. So that's so important that you have systems and processes in place so that you can rely on them and know them. And you feel much more confident at the counter when you can be clear, concise, and you can really, really help your your customers to Absolutely. get them the most value and have that concise and clear communication so that they understand. Because Aaron, I think as, that's perfect example of of what you see in this in this stuff. That all three of those things fit what you just described with the low staffing uh, situation, uh, the the time, the wait times, less helpful advice, and less courtesy. It seems. All those things of a very rushed person who's too busy. Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll bring technology. You know, as I'm, I'm cursing technology, I'm going to talk out of the other side of my mouth. And this goes to something as simple as as a, an inspection, a digital inspection, right? It is value, right? In a day and age where I think people are very particular about what they're spending their money on. If I go to the store, I can show you what I have in my grocery bag. If I go to an auto repair shop, they fix $1,000 worth of stuff. I didn't get an inspection. I can't really tell my spouse or significant other what what I, I spent my money on. If I have that inspection, I can go back and look and show you these pictures. It is value based, and I think there is a lot of like if you think about it and you take the time to do the pictures and all those things, like people appreciate that, right? It's part of a way we can use technology to I think create a relationship and a positive relationship, right? Where you know we all are worried about our time. But you know, a lot of times as, as service advisors, we try and fit in a lot of things, but with these tools that we can use, yeah. I think it can certainly help in, in the experience and, and make it maybe not as seem as as uh, you know rushed on the call that I'm trying to sell you a thousand dollar stuff. And mm-hmm. I know we beat this digital inspection thing to the ground, but as you and I know, I, I still don't think the adoption is anywhere close to what it should be in the industry. And and oh, Vic yeah. and, and Marianne, I, I'm assuming uh, y'all would say the same. 
I agree. It, it's not. It's it's not where it should be. People have it. Yes. You know, the, the bulk of the shops have it, but how many are using it correctly? I'll and this give goes you to a... process. Marianne, process. Yeah. To the you, fullest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I didn't I know it had that feature. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the human component of those pieces as well is one of the things I looked at this and I see a lot of people look at technology as something that is going to come between people and not a, a, a build a relationship. It should be op the opposite. But if you get lazy with technology, you're counting on it to do something for you mm. so you don't have to, that's that's the wrong approach. I believe it's very much something that you do that makes something you are doing and care to do better and more efficient. That's how technology should get leveraged, not as a crutch. I'm going to steal this, this, and I've used it before, this truest, the bank that came up and it was touch plus technology equals transparency, right? Um, and, and it truly is, you, you, you still have the touch of the service visor, you have the technology of what you do with your digital landscape, those combined, right, create this transparent and, and this, this, this trust type transaction that you can have that's very powerful with your consumer. Well, I think trust is the operative word here too, is we have this, the brand report that just dropped as well. This is again, another hot off the press report, folks. Uh, even just this morning, uh, one of our newsletters at The Hustle was dissecting a component of this and Generation Z coming up, a lot less trust in some of the top brands of trustworthiness in this country. And there's an inverse to this too, that I thought was very interesting based on a book that Chris had actually recommended me called Thou Shall Prosper. Uh, it's a brilliant read. Uh, we'll have to put that in chat here in a moment too. But kids today being taught business is bad. Uh, so often like that these corporate brands are some sort of an evil entity that's that's going to harm uh, rather than help and that the greater good is going to be found in nonprofits and those sort of things. So already coming into this world and brought up into a concept that nonprofits better than a for-profit business and having a, a, a clear semblance of distrust for these, that's kind of alarming. And that puts the emphasis, the onus is really firmly on us to become better communicators to reach this growing upcoming audience. Any thoughts on this, folks? Well, Marianne? Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, trust from the younger generation, they grew up really with less in-person communication. Mm -hmm. So they're very used to going online. And I think that that's where some of this comes from because they haven't had the opportunity to develop a lot of in-person relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural progression. It was funny, years ago, uh, I was at a career fair and the automotive class was coming out and came over to our booth and we were talking to them and I had some samples, uh, some framed uh, frames of the different organizations, community service that we were doing. And it was amazing how many of them asked questions about that more so than the technical side of the business. It was very surprising. Oh, and what's this organization? And what do you do here? And how are you involved with this? They were very, very curious about the organizations and charities, the local charities that we were involved in. So that really does add to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. well, and look, looking at your the, the uh, survey, the, the least communicative, the most difficult to get in touch with somebody, a live body, is Amazon. And they're the mm -hmm. greatest trust trusted in, in that Gen Z and all, <laughs> all, all adults. Yes. And the question, when I look at these results, I, I ask the question, why? Why is it that we have these results? And, and I think the power, the, go ahead, Greg. No, no I'm, I'm I was, was going to say, they'll say that the, the power of the connection, going back to what we said earlier, isn't necessarily reflected here, but it could be that they, right now, they undervalue that power of connection. So yeah. perhaps the onus is on the advisors to build those relationships, to connect with Gen Z in a way that they never experienced before, build trust. Because mm -hmm. what, I, what I, I see is when you have somebody who's very distrusting and you are able to gain their trust, it's almost unbreakable. And I'm going to expand on that shall prosper, Craig. It, it's yeah. a good point to bring up right in the beginning of the book. He basically took and he has 10 prosperous 
kind of ideals to follow uh, to prosper in your life. And and it's it's a great book. It's a long it's a long book. I suggested it to somebody else, and and somebody uh, said, "Chris, this is a super long book." I'm like, "Yeah, but trust me when you get through it." But to that to your point, Craig, like. Our, this generation is also being raised on every villain in every movie is the corporate guy, right? Who wants mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, he's it's it, it, so we villainize now the the the, the you know the, the corporate guy, raider, right? He's going to create mm -hmm. the disease, or he's going to create the super bomb, or he's going to create whatever, and and his whole point is is very valid. Business is in its own effect, a huge charity, right? It, it is a good, in its core, it's a good thing. What we do is we hire people that allow their children to go to school. We allow them to pay their rent. We allow them to buy the car. We allow them to go on vacation. We allow them to go down to the, to the fast food place to go buy the burger that then employs another person, right? So mm -hmm. business within itself is its own entity and it, and it spreads mm -hmm. its own joy and love, but we've gotten so far away from that right? Yeah. And it is funny, right, Vic, you said, you know, Amazon's the most trusted one. But then you look and you go, you know, really, because then if you look at the, the, the you know, if you if they put Jeff Bezos in front of everybody, he's villainized, right? Oh, he, sure. He's a bad, he's bad. And as soon as they realize that Bezos is part of Amazon, Amazon immediately would go down, but they don't know that yeah. they know this is why they trust Amazon, I click a button. And two days later, this thing shows up. They trust yeah, the brand. Absolutely. Well, and, and Lee, Lee respond, Lee responded in, in the chat. He said, Amazon responds almost immediately. And mm -hmm. you think about that. There, You have a concern. You put it in the chat. You get a response right away. What does that say about us as communicators? We need to come up with an answer quicker and connect, mm -hmm. connect with their customer who has an issue. Mm -hmm. that was, that, that was, I love all that power of the chat. I Thanks do too. That in, Lee. Yeah, I think there's a flip side to this as well, because true or false, we're starting to hire Gen Z into our service counters. Mm -hmm. Right, they're they're coming in there, and if they already have, like Chris was describing, they did a good job in, in the book "Thou Shall Prosper" because we've all been bombarded with these stories. And no matter how much we know, some of these are fantastic Disney stories with the villain bosses. Fiction, a little seed gets planted in the back of our minds that whether we're cognizant of the bias or not, it's there, and it will shape how we approach things. And it does affect people in their day to day jobs and how they communicate with people if they feel in some way that what they're doing is not virtuous, noble, and good, they are not going to more effectively communicate those virtues of your business to your clients. And in order to do that, that's an orientation shift that has to occur top down in your organization to help this younger generation communicate better what our values are, why this is good, noble, and how it contributes to our community in a very positive way that they can be proud of. That will give them the confidence to start to talk about this themselves. And that's a key tool in order to do so. This well, goes now, further. Now, now, see, now, Go we step into, now we step into the shop owner's responsibility. Yes. Where the shop, shop owner takes the time to, to convey to his team, this is the impact that we're making. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I have shops and I know shops who the, the more they make, the more they give to the community. A broke shop is not a blessing to the community. No. A prospering shop can make an impact. A prospering shop can, can make donations. It can, it can take people to places that they wouldn't be able to go. And this is, it needs to become part of the mission of the owner to convey to his team, this is why this is good. And convey to the customers in a way that they're proud of being part of the community, right. that the community is the star, not yeah. that it looks like, you know, they're kind of bragging about what they do, but how they're so happy to be part of the community and make that organization or whatever that is that they're doing, make them the star, Absolutely. educate people a little bit more about it. That's a great way to do it. I, I think love so what too. you just said, Vic. One right, of the I things we... that, uh, oh, that's ahead, not, right. one, one of the things that uh, I, I learned that I conveyed to my, my team was something that our pastor at our church said, if, if God would supernaturally take our church out of the community, would anybody notice? <laughs> and he wants that answer to be resounding. Yes. And in, I took that to our staff and I said, okay, at VIX, if it disappeared today, would anybody really notice the impact that we make? And I right. said, we need to have that be a yes in every single thing we do from it, whether we're in, in the bays, behind the counter, or out in public, 
we need to make certain that we are a blessing wherever we go. We are making mm -hmm. an impact in the community. And I would, I would challenge the people who are listening to ask yourself that question. If, if your shop were to Brilliant. roll up today, would anybody in your community know this? Brilliant. I love that. I, I think my, is my internet going out? No, you're Craig? Okay. That's another reason why you don't invite me anymore. Yeah. I would just say like all the <laughs> shop owners on here and I, you know, the community and I agree, I love that impact. I'm going to take it to, as an owner, what kind of impact are you making on your people? Yeah. Are you educating? Are you, are you forcing them to go get those ASCs, whether they want them or not, because you know that in the long run that they are going to be better off when they have those certifications? And they go, it doesn't matter, Chris. It doesn't mean anything. But I say, I promise you, if you go move to another state and you have five ASC certifications and that you go into that shop and they say, no, we're not hiring. And you go, I have five ASC certifications. I guarantee you get an interview. And, mm -hmm. and I guarantee you. So what are we doing as shop owners to pour into our people? And most shop owners, right? That That's part of our mission. And part of our purpose is to build our people internally. And what can we do to make an effect on our people just internally, right? right? Yeah. Right. And it'll have an, absolutely should have an effect on community. And I feel that the, that community level is, is the thing that becomes a challenge today with all the technology and the great distances that we can communicate with the local community. If we can make that stronger, a lot of these mistrust issues go away at a local level much better. You can keep distrusting governments or schools or all these other things, but if you have that that element in your community that you can rely on and trust, that's going to, especially in independent shops, that's power. You become yeah. a resource and people see you as that way. Absolutely. You're, yeah. you're, the, tru you're the trusted community partner. Absolutely. And we and can Craig, get to that point where we can communicate. Yeah, Chris. We know, we know when all the bad people uh, force out the good people, all you have left is bad people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you don't want us all going away. Yeah, Even though don't. we get the bad Google review and we're like, no, 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 we're good people. Sometimes we yeah. just got to let that roll off, realize that we're the good guys and the good girls in the fight. And, and we got to let it roll off us because we're not going to win all of them. Right? It's a subtle we're, reorientation. Yeah. Uh, Bob Greenwood, we were talking about him a little before we started the webinar. I know you all know him and 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 love the man and, and lament his passing in 2021. Uh, Bob had a wonderful way in his course, uh, his all day course. I loved how he did. He asked the question. I've asked this so many times for our audience, but it was always the same question. I've heard him do it. What's your job? And someone all, like me <laughs> sitting in the classroom, well, I fix cars, right? No, your job, your professional responsibility is to make sure that vehicle is safe, reliable, and efficient. That's the job. And you would go into this stuff where we won't let you down, Mr. Client. And that's why we do an inspection on every car. And that changed the whole orientation of the visit and the whole way the customer understands what it's like to be a client, not a customer, in that shop. And it just resonated through my heart and soul. And that is what put me on the path that I ended up going on. And that brought me even to where I am now because of that subtle reorientation of our that purpose behind what we do that is noble and good. Uh, that's where it can start. Fun stuff though, right? These reports with this uh, oh, yeah. Gen Z coming up. I find this stuff so fascinating when it complements something we're already trying to address. <laughs> and this is why we have Toastmaster veterans here today, because we do believe, and I think you've seen the passion on this panel is obvious. Uh, and being Toastmaster veterans, I think it's important to elaborate for everyone. What exactly is Toastmasters. And I'm going to launch a poll while we answer this too, because I want to know how many people are familiar with uh, Toastmasters already, if they are at all. Wow. Uh, I, I, I would say the simplest way to describe Toastmasters, it's a training ground in a safe place to improve your ability to communicate, not to speak, but to communicate, because communication is two, two ways. Hmm. It's speaking, but more importantly, listening. And it's, it's safe evaluations. It's, it, it is a great place to develop. My, my first speech that I gave was, was our icebreaker for our, our, yeah. at our club. And I, was, I had the death grip on the, on the, on the platform, on the podium. <laughs> and it, over, that, over the time, I learned how to, how to give a good speech, learned how to be able to connect with, with clients. Because as, as an advisor, especially, you get an, an off-the-cuff question. You've got to come an answer pretty quickly. Very it helps you with that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mechanically, Toastmasters is really this. And I try to answer this succinctly for people when they ask me what it is. It's, it is hard to explain uh, because you have to go to check it out and you can go as a guest freely, but it's basically a volunteer organization run by volunteers to develop leadership and communication skills, like Vic was saying. And there are online learning pathways, a little bit of a learning management system curriculum that people will be guided on. They'll conduct speeches, learn how to give evaluations and feedback themselves. All of these are characteristics of becoming leaders as well as communicators in, in, your, in every circle of life, not just business, uh, but in all circles of life. And it's positive and it's consistent and it's cost-effective. Those are the main points. Uh, so it's worth checking out. And I think that when we're checking this out, I think it's important to know what a meeting actually functions like. Uh, now, and I want to say, Chris is the one that sent me to Toastmasters. It was I, after a some demo or presentation we did. It was it was quite some time ago, but uh, boy, it was right. Must have been 2019, somewhere in there, 2018 possibly. I finally got around to getting into a meeting and loved it. And immediately want to do this all the time, but I wasn't a bad communicator. But Chris, having a veteran Toastmasters eye for the structure of a presentation and, and how well someone's connecting with an audience could see room for improvement. Mm. And Chris could give feedback very well. I And to Chris's credit, uh, that is not something I had experience with in my life to that point, people giving feedback effectively. And so, of course, guards up most of the time when yeah. people are receiving feedback. But I took that, he recognized, I'm, I'm someone who does take feedback, I think fairly well. I want to grow with it. And I will usually apply things that are put in front of me. I launched into this and I never looked back. From the first meeting I was a guest, I became a member immediately. And I've barely missed a single week except for travel circumstances for my hometown club, uh, who also subsequently became adult friends. That meeting, the way it begins is simply with planned speeches at the front part of the meeting and impromptu speaking towards the end. Planned speeches are for members. Impromptu speaking is for guests, table topics. And then there's roles that you can take. And I'd like to uh, ask you guys to elaborate on what your favorite part of a Toastmasters meeting is, as you tell us uh, how it benefits you as well. Marianne, do you want to start? Well, I have a couple of different uh, ones. There were so much about Toastmasters that I liked. I went in and thought I was going to go there for the commu communication side and didn't, I, I guess I under underestimated the value of the leadership part as well, because we all influence others every day. So I found that to be really uh, valuable. But as far as the meetings go, I have to say, I think it's tie between the speeches and the impromptu speaking because speeches are planned and it's it you can take an hour or half an hour to put everything into a speech but try to narrow that down to seven minutes <laughs> that is a challenge so I find that pretty exciting and the other part is the impromptu which I really like because a lot of times we are asked to speak off the cuff so it's nice to be able to do that. Yeah, valuable skill, the extemporaneous speaking uh, that, that we call it, which is 90% of all the stuff that we do ever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm with Marianne, you know, minor the impromptu. That's, a, that's the first one, I, I, first thing comes top of top mind because we get asked these questions like you just asked us. We weren't prepared for that question, but we gave an answer. We also learned, have to learn how to sidestep questions yeah and how to give an answer that is not placating but an answer that is will, will help them to understand but the the what i've learned where i've learned the most from is actually preparing speeches mm -hmm. like marianne said it's kind of hard to cram it into a, a six minute spot yeah but that learning how to speak and crafting a speech with the opening the body and conclusion is what enabled me to write for Shop Owner Magazine. Yeah. Because I, I learned how to tell a story and craft it, craft, craft a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And that's about a seven minute speech. Greg, I'm going to have to say, I, I'm going to go to the feedback portion. We, we brushed on you. this. As far as a service advisor and a service writer, 
consultant, counterperson, and we go back to listening, right? In, in the evaluation section, you're forced to listen to the speech. You're forced to evaluate the speech. You have to understand how to evaluate a speech, the positive feedback to give, the negative feedback to give, and do it in a way that the person's going to receive it and they're going to receive it well. I've, I've said this quote. I've, I'm coining this quote. quote the feedback is like a gift you receive on Christmas morning. Yep. I remember it, when you coined this. Regift it or throw it away. But when the person gives it to you, you smile because you're certainly not going to throw away that gift in front of Aunt Rita. Because if you do, she's going to slap your face off, right? And that's what you learn in Toastmasters, which is super important for a service advisor. All the other impromptu extraneous speaking is also great, but goes back to: Are you listening when you're communicating? Are you mm -hmm. you understanding what they're telling you? Are you understanding their needs? Or are you asking questions about? the things that they're coming in for, right? Because a lot of, yes. I, I see this a lot and I tell my wife this a lot, it, you know, the it, I, five uh, whys um, in Lean Six Sigma, I think is what they call it. And there's all kinds of different philosophies, but really the more questions you can ask, right? And in feedback, you're not really asking the questions in Toastmasters, right? But I always ask, you know, what, what kind of questions when you're getting those feedback, let me guess more and more and let me get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and why, why, why? And you start learning that the person asking the question is actually in control control the conversation, right? They're yes. always the one who gets to lead the conversation wherever you want to go. But a lot of times people won't ask questions, right? They just state what they know and they, and they assume the other person is going to receive it versus let me ask you a bunch of questions. I'm going to lead you someplace that you want to go and it's going to be a good place. Absolutely. I think there's a component to all this stuff too. And Chris, one of the things you encouraged early on when I first joined this company, I thought that was really unique is you encouraged me to be my own brand. And part of that is, is understanding how you're actually being received by other people. Because there's what you're projecting, and then there's what you're receiving. And that evaluation component is priceless, especially when it's in a group of people that are positive, that want to see you succeed. And that's the safe environment that Toastmasters offers. These are not clients. They're paying you money. These are people on the same journey as you that are trying to build you up and learning how to build themselves up better as well. It's mutually beneficial. I'm really glad you mentioned evaluation because it is my favorite role in meeting now. I used to, I, uh, the roles are great. The ah, er counter whose job it is to listen for the ahs, ers, ums, and anything that's not a, just a nice pause when you're trying to think of the next thing you're trying to say. That made me better at finding where I was uttering ums and ahs. And those are so distracting after so long you'll find people's nervous tics in a three-hour course like the types that we have to do in this industry. They aren't 20-minute keynotes in most cases, right, folks? These are three, four-hour things. And if you have a tick where you're going, ah, um, or just tisking or whatever it is that you do, people start to pick up on it. And it gets really kind of comical with some speakers, and I don't like to judge it <laughs> when people aren't in Toastmasters. But once I'm onto it now, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> you can see other people's uh, attention wanes in those sort of moments too. Taking that out or counter role makes you so cognizant by listening for everyone else's in a meeting makes you aware of your own. You feel like you're judging when you take the role is like, who am I to take this role and count theirs? Mine probably suck. <laughs> and, and yet you, what the unspoken thing is with Toastmasters, these evaluation roles that you're taking force you to listen to other people for the things that you will learn to find in yourself. And that is helpful, especially in that positive environment. But these roles, I encourage you to check this out in a meeting as a guest. You won't be able to take a role as a guest, but you definitely get to see them perform those evaluations. You might even be asked to give a grow and a glow to the speaker. That's how we do it in our club. We always ask everyone to chat, private message to the person who spoke, one grow, one glow. And there's a universal thing I've noticed with new guests and new members. They have a very hard time identifying a grow, something that can improve for another speaker because we don't feel qualified to criticize that. And it feels in their mind like criticism. It isn't. The difference between feedback and criticism is paramount to Toastmasters. It is meant to help someone. And all you have to do is speak from your own perspective on how you received their message so that they can improve the message to connect with you better. So it is just about how you felt. And that helps the people is when we point out, just make an I feel statement about something they could have improved that would have helped you get more from their presentation. It's like, oh, okay, I can do that. 
versus trying to mechanically make someone better as a speaker when I don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> Wait, what, what that really comes down to, Craig, is you're sharing an observation. You may not be yes. right or wrong, but this is just my observation. Exactly. Your it's perspective. Quality. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it's good to listen to someone's perspective because they may see something that you don't. Absolutely. We all have blind spots. So being yeah. around people that are there willing, they all have the same goal. They want to develop themselves. They want to grow and get better. Yeah. Being around other people there that can support you is a great way for you to develop personally, whether it's uh, in your career, you know, or in your personal life. Yeah. Yeah. It's step one. To join. Go ahead. Chris. Communication is key, right? So to everything and all that we do. And, and I would just say from a shop owner's perspective too, I, another good book, if you haven't read it as a shop owner or anybody, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by uh, John Maxwell, right? And law number one is a uh, law of the lid, which says that you're the lid, right? In your organization, you're the lid in your life, right? You're the one who holds yourself back from growing. So if you want your people in your shop to be great communicators, and you're not so much a great communicator, you should look in the mirror and say, what am I doing to raise my lid? And as I raise my lid, then everybody else is gonna to wanna to increase their capacity as well, right? So a lot of times we gotta look in the mirrors and say, what are we doing? And and this is scary. What's what's the, the statistic, Craig, on, uh, what is it, glassophobia? Glassophobia, 75% glassophobia. of humans are scared to get in front of a group and talk. And it is scary. I Vic, mm -hmm. I can... I remember my first speech vividly and I'm like, uh, I can't believe. And, you know, I remember going to the meeting and I'm like, I play in a rock band. I'm cool. Like I, I get up on stage in front of a hundred people, not a problem. Take the bike away, take the guitar away, take the drunk audience away. And I'm, uh, and I, I mean, you know, it's like, it's one of those things that you burn in your brain. You never forget yep. that first speech you get up, right? What's, what's cool is you look back and go, you know what? That was, I took a step. Yeah. And another step, you, you weren't scared enough, too scared to stand in front of somebody. You knew you needed to take that step. I have also found, video. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Marianne. Go ahead, I have also found in Toastmasters that there's so many good people, like we said, like-minded people that join. There's always someone there who's willing to mentor you. If yes. you want to practice this speech mm -hmm. out or, you know, you're, thinking about omitting something or adding something, whatever it is, there's people there that'll mentor you and say, let's, you know, run it by me and work with you as well. Yeah. Marianne, I've done that with presentations I've presented to the industry. And I'm known in my club for presenting things. And of course, I might have to do an hour presentation and chop it down to five minutes, like you right. say, but at least it is this capturing, is, am I on the right target for what I'm doing? It is a great Petri dish for people doing a, you know, a, a toast at a, a wedding. Lab. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the lab. Yeah. It so is. we had a great guest speaker in our home club here in Grand Rapids Toastmasters last night. I put a Facebook post on it. Uh, Dr. Paul Ar Artelay, Artelay, uh fantastic accredited speaker, distinguished Toastmaster. He's from the Detroit area, I found out, and, uh, and also was born and raised in Canada. So Peter Foreman, you'd probably really like him too. <laughs> we pick on Peter. It's all right. He likes it. <laughs> but no, uh, Paul had a couple of things that he wrote, his whole thing was on confidence and speaking. And so what a timely thing. I couldn't have coordinated this webinar with that presentation at, at all. It just happened to be that way. And he, he described a scenario with his young son and he has a whole speech on this. So I'm just going to very paraphrase it, but he calls these things yaks, these things that get in your way. And you have to hear his story about how his son taught him this as two-year-old son taught him this, but yak one, a, a barrier is what a yak is in this story isn't good enough. That's something that people tell themselves. It keeps them from getting out there and, and practicing their communications. But like they don't have something worth sharing. Yak number two, he said, is you're not a natural speaker. Therefore, that's just not for you. It's not who you are. It's not what you're already good at. And I think that's a very common one as well. Yak three is you'll be alone up there on a stage or talking with another individual and you feel isolated. And that's not the case. Uh, that's a, a common misconception as well. And yak four it's not the right time to start working on this skill or improving. And that is the excuse most people feed us like, or I don't have the time. And uh, folks, this is, this is something that we have to deal with every day to succeed in society. And we've seen it now with multiple reports, JD Power. We've seen it now with the, uh, the other report on, on trust. Uh, 
we've got to connect better. Uh, fortunately, we've already been working up a solution, and this group is a part of that. Uh, we've started a Toastmasters club that meets online for automotive repair specialists. Now, I've been a big advocate for encouraging people to go to their home clubs and develop connections in their local communities, always will. I'm now a member of two Toastmaster clubs, <laughs> this one and my hometown club, and that won't ever change because I love my local group of professionals and they, they become friends as well. But this one, I encourage you to check out. We meet tomorrow uh, is our next meeting. We meet at two Eastern, actually same time as the reason we're having the webinar today, not tomorrow, so that Chris can make it to his first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> come as a guest you're welcome to join us as guests the link is on that website so scan that qr code please feel free to join us uh we will try to meet bi-weekly on this uh so vic and marianne are also uh will be charter members as soon as we get chartered yep. <laughs> <laughs> and your experience has been great and i wanted to publicly thank you for being a part of this too it can't happen uh, without folks like you chris and i have been kicked around the idea but eventually, this is just a Toastmasters club. I love the fact that we get to be influential in the beginning of it. But what you all know in Toastmasters, I think, is true. Its success depends on bringing someone else to come up, take the helm, and carry it forward beyond us. Exactly. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Do you guys have any words of encouragement you want to throw at people to check this out? I'll, I would say this. I encourage you to, to, to do, do come, come to this Remarkable Results Toastmasters simply because it's a great place. Dip your toe in the water. What's the worst thing that can happen? You spend an hour with, with some good friends and, and yeah. learn a few things? Absolutely. You'll have a lot of laughs. Uh, it's, it is so rewarding to take the time to invest in yourself. I think as owners, as leaders, as you know, people that are on the front counter, we don't do that often enough. We should do that more. Yeah. And investing in yourself is the best thing you can do. And Craig, I'll, I'll, then one of our classes that we do, it, we reference the book, Change or Die. Yes. And it talks about the three steps to change. One is getting in that group of people that want to change, right? And then it's practicing over and over again, that change that you want to make. And then it's reframing that change that you are in the process of doing. And that's just Toastmasters, right? Bingo. You're relating to everybody in the group because everybody wants to be a better speaker. You're practicing every other week. Sometimes you're practicing more than that because you got a speech coming up and you want to make sure that when you give it to the group that you don't suck. And then that feedback is allowing you to reframe your presentation so you get better at not using the ahs and ums and you get better at using your hands. You're not doing this awkward you know, you know, Ricky Bobby, it's always funny. Like I like that movie, right? Where he's sitting there, what do I do with my hands? He's like, just put them at your side. And he's just like, you know, it, very awkward, but we see that with people. So I would yeah. say, if you want to change, like Vic said, like you don't lose anything by it, come in. The, 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 there is a method to change and, and Toastmasters is that method if you want to become a, a better communicator. And none of us, I was not a good communicator. I wish I really did have videos and could show people how poorly I was Craig you were good when 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 I saw you I was bad I I could complete a sentence I I was uh, uh, I was bad and you know through the grace of God I go software developer. And, yeah. and I, I was software <laughs> developer. I computers I could talk to um, people I couldn't now but 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 communication is important and of course I can talk to computers now but I can talk to people too and that's made my life so much better my wife appreciates so that I bet. Oh, of course, the, the oh, marriages yeah. are all improved here, too, guys. Understated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you become a better listener. Ah. Yeah. You don't right. have to reinvent the wheel. A Toastmasters no. really is a framework. Yes. So it's there. It's tried and true. It's been around for, for so long. And if the you mentioned, Craig, being in a group in your hometown, the nice yeah. thing is, is the format is the same no yep. matter what group you're in. So it makes it another tool for you to have. Absolutely. And if you're thinking like, I don't really ever want to be a speaker in front of a group of people. I have lots of members in that group. They'll never do a large audience type presentation, but they want to be better leaders with their teams that they're managing. They want to be better employees and communicating any reports that they have to do in their businesses. A lot of times I've seen people practice boring sales presentations and we help them spice it up a little bit. And that's fun. Uh, they, they enjoy that sort of thing. There's all sorts of reasons. This just makes you better at communicating with 
everyone that you meet. I have one member uh, that I'll call out, uh, Shane Stevers. Uh, he was the president uh, when I first joined. He's still been an officer uh, throughout these other years too. We've worked together now in the officer team uh, in our home club. And he's got this presence when you're talking to him one-on-one, -on -one, just one-on-one, -on -one, that makes you feel like, yeah, you're the most important person right now. That is a, that is a skill uh, that he, I'm still trying to master uh, and developing. But Toastmasters is a major, major piece in developing that. You want that client in front of you. You want your employees or coworkers or colleagues or friends or wife to feel that way anytime you're talking to them. And it's it's a, a, a stretching exercise of the brain. That Paul Artelli that gave us that speech last night, He I asked him the question of what he gets out of Toastmasters as a, as a now accredited paid speaker that goes around the country speaking. He said, that's my gym. It's my gymnasium. That's that's where I go to work out. Keep keep exercising those muscles, uh, because it never. You can't let this plateau just like any other skill. Yeah. So there's that QR code. Hope you all received that. I think we've done a decent job talking today on on what we consider compelling speech and its benefits. Uh, any any closing remarks that you guys want to make on this piece? I'll I'll say this. I'll add, add one add one thing about to an owner. Giving team meetings requires skill. And you, you come into Toastmasters, we'll help you develop that ability to give a meeting, but also listen to your team. You know, Cub, Cubby said it this way in, in his Habit Habits of Highly Effective People. Seek first to understand. That's listening. Then to be understood. That's, that's responding to what you heard. Yeah, to tag on to what Vic said, you know, uh, there's a there's a book out leaders, eat, leaders eat last, right? And the mm -hmm. idea is let everyone speak first. Because if a leader comes up with an idea, an owner, and says, oh, I was thinking that we would do something this way in, in a team meeting, everyone's going to be like, oh, yeah, okay. But if you ask for people's input to tag on to what Vic was saying, and you were to speak last, now you're really listening to what people are saying. This also helps you with structuring a meeting, facilitating a meeting, and your team understands the structure now because it's done the exact same way every time. If you're out, you can actually have someone else run the meeting. Yeah. So it's a great skill. That is great. Craig, I'm going to close with be your own brand. Like I've told you, I yeah. suggest everybody on this panel, like what does that mean to be your own brand? First, you got to know thyself. Mm -hmm. know your limitations, grow your, grow yourself. Right. And, and, and what does it mean to be your own brand? I, I think when you understand what it means, it, 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 it your, your pay goes up, your, your lot in life goes up, your relationships get better. Right. And too many times we, we think we're somebody else's brand. Right. And I'm, I'm the brand of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just make that right. But, but, but even in him, he says, Hey, let us be the salt and light. Right. So, so what am I doing to influence people? Right. And what is, what is the, the walk that I'm taking right to show others what I, you know, I, I do and who I am and what, what I represent. Right. So being your own brand, even though you're working for somebody and you're working for me, Craig, you've done a great job of, of you do, you go out and you speak, you, you're very eloquent when you speak, you're running these great webinars, all this stuff. Right. And this will get you a lot further in life, right. Than thinking that in your limited mindset that all you can be is this because that was all you were given and when you realize what you really have this is really what you have but so many times we think this is it and and you know by being our own brand we're not right we we're ah we can't be on i work for so and so it's just not true it's yeah, not absolutely. true you, you you are working for yourself and ultimately mm -hmm. you're the one you have to answer to yep hey, it's a people business bottom line and this group of people joining me today Vic, Marianne, Chris, thank you for taking time out of your extremely busy schedules and you're traveling around and doing your things. This has been a great conversation. And I want to encourage anyone that's in the audience, if you have questions on this topic, someone to reach out to. These folks, genuine, good folks. Don't hesitate to reach out to them. Thank you so Thanks. much for joining us, guys. Thanks thank for you. having me. Great. No, see you at Toastmasters. That's my last remark. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I will see Vic and Marianne. I'll see you tomorrow. Yes. Perfect. Chris, you too? I believe so. All right. See you then, guys. Thanks so much. See y'all later. Thank you. Bye-bye.